So now that we understand some of the properties of stars, their range of sizes, luminosities, temperatures, that sort of thing, now let's start talking about how do stars form, and then we'll begin talking about the life cycle of a star. But before we even get into that, we've got a clicker question. So here is our first lecture quiz question. How long will the sun live? A. 100,000 years. B. 10 million years. C. 10 billion years. Or D. 1 trillion years. Go ahead and think about it, and we'll discuss in just a bit. All right, do you remember how long the sun's going to last? The correct answer is C, 10 billion years. Okay, so the sun is going to remain on, this, on the main sequence for about 10 billion years. So, if stars live for millions, billions, and then we saw in the case of really low mass stars, even trillions of years, then how is it that we humans who have a maximum lifespan of somewhere around 100 years, can figure out how does it they form, age, and die. Well, part of it is that we don't watch a single star. We don't have time to be able to watch a single star. So instead, we look at the giant sample of all of the stars we have in our own Milky Way galaxy. Currently, it is estimated that there's between 200 billion and 300 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. That is a lot of stars that we can use to figure out what's going on. So we can piece together all of these different things to figure out how it is that stars form, age, and die. The other thing that we can do is create stellar models. So we know all of the physics that goes into stars, so we can create computer simulations. And in those computer simulations, we can see how it is that things are going to change over time. Well, all stars begin from the interstellar medium. So inter means between, stellar is star, and medium is stuff. So the interstellar medium is literally the stuff between the stars. Okay, so this is the gas and dust that we find between stars. The interstellar medium is about 74% hydrogen, 25% helium, and 1% everything else. I hope that those numbers sounded familiar. This is the exact same ratios that we talked about previously, or at least close, with the sun, and then also with the general composition of stars. Pay attention, we're going to keep seeing these numbers. At some point, we're going to have to be able to explain them. Well, the interstellar medium is not perfectly uniform. There are some places where it is thicker and places where it is thinner. In the regions where it is thick enough that we can actually see it, these are what we refer to as nebula. A nebula is a giant cloud of gas and dust in space that is thick enough we can actually see it for some reason. There are three types of nebula. The first one we're going to talk about are ones that are particularly dense and very cold. Because they are very cold, they're not going to be producing their own visible light, and because they're very dense, will obscure the light that does try to pass through them. Now, these things are cold enough that they can actually form molecules and have dust particles inside. Because of that, these are sometimes referred to as molecular clouds, and because they absorb the light that hit them and don't produce any visible light, they are referred to as dark nebula. So, as an example, here we have an image of a dark nebula. There was actually a period in time where some people thought that some of these dark nebula was actually just a hole in the stars, a region where there just weren't any stars. That is, in fact, not the case. It's that there's a big cloud of stuff right there blocking the light. Now, dark nebulae can be between 10 and 100 Kelvin. Now, remember what Kelvin is. This is the scale, the temperature scale that we like to use in astronomy, where zero Kelvin is the coldest that anything can be. So this is between 10 and 100 above absolute zero. So these are really, really cold. Our second type of nebula are ones that actually produce their own light. These types of nebula are referred to as emission nebula because they are emitting light. 
One great example of this is the Orion Nebula. So if you're familiar with the constellation Orion, the one that most people are familiar with are the three stars that form the belt, just below that there's this glowing region. That is not stars, that is actually a nebula. The nebula is bright enough it can actually be seen with the naked eye. So the way that these emission nebula glow, it actually starts with young hot stars that actually formed inside. We'll see later that the first types of stars to actually form are going to be the highest mass and therefore the very hottest, the O and B type stars. Well, these stars are so hot that they're going to be giving off prim primarily ultraviolet light. Now, what color are we going to see with our eyes? They're going to be bluish in color. Remember, the bluest stars are the very hottest. So these O and B stars, although they appear blue to our eyes, actually give off mostly ultraviolet light. This ultraviolet light has enough energy that when it hits the electron, the electron gets kicked out of the atom. This is what we call ionization. So the ultraviolet light ionizes the hydrogen. So then we have positive and negative charges floating around the cloud. Ionized hydrogen, hydrogen that has lost its electron, is also known as H2. So these are referred to as H2 regions. An emission nebula and an H2 region are actually the same thing. Now with these positive and negative charges, they want to attract and recombine. Now when they do, the electron doesn't jump all the way down to the lowest energy level closest to the nucleus. Instead, it makes these little hops. What this does is it actually gives off visible light with those little hops. So in this overall process, we convert ultraviolet light from hot young stars inside of the emission nebula into visible light being given off by the nebula. In this way, it actually glows. Now the primary, now the primary line that is being given off is in the hydrogen sequence, also known as the Balmer sequence, and this light is generally pink. So emission nebula tend to be pink in color. The last type of nebula we're going to discuss are reflection nebula. Reflection. In this case, we do not have hot young stars embedded inside the nebula. Instead, we have a nebula next to some hot young stars. The light from these young stars is then going to reflect off of the dust grains within the, oh, the nebula and causing it to appear bright. Now the nebula itself is not glowing, it is only reflecting the light of the stuff nearby. This is a reflection nebula. Now because of the grains that the, are reflecting the light, these tend to be bluish in color. So reflection nebula tend to be blue, emission nebula are pink, and dark nebula are dark. I realize dark's not a color, but it conveys the right idea. All right, so here we have an overall nebula complex, meaning we have a really big nebula that has all of these different features. So notice we have the overall pink. What kind of nebula is the overall pink stuff? It's an emission nebula. Right here, we have this bluish region. What's the blue nebula? It's a reflection. And then here and there, we have these dark regions. Those are dark nebula. So we have all of the different types within one overall nebula complex. Here is our second lecture quiz question. Why are sunsets red? A. The light has been redshifted as the Earth moves away from the sun. B. The blue light is scattered so only the red light reaches us. Or C. The light is gravitationally redshifted as it passes close to the Earth. Go ahead and think about it and we'll discuss in just a bit. All right, I realize this seems like it doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about, but it'll make sense in a, in a little bit. But why are sunsets red? The answer is B. Our atmosphere scatters out blue light better than it does red light. So red light keeps streaming through the atmosphere so that we see it. The blue light hits the atmosphere and gets scattered out, so the red light actually reaches us. So the correct answer is B. Alright, so the reason that I bring this up is because although nebulae are what we see, 
it's not the only part of the interstellar medium. There's actually interstellar medium everywhere, it's just that it's obvious when we see them as nebulae. But this interstellar medium does actually affect light. Specifically, it scatters out shorter wavelengths better than it does longer wavelengths, similar to our atmosphere. So what this means is light that has traveled a, th a greater distance through our galaxy, where we've got a lot of interstellar medium, more blue light gets scattered out, so objects appear redder. So, as an example, here we have two emission nebula. Okay, so one on the right, one on the left. Now, based off of simply the color, only the color, the one on the left has to be farther away. It appears redder because a lot of more of the blue light has been scattered out. The one on the right that is more pinkish, that is lighter in color, still has a lot of the blue, and therefore it has to be closer. Now, something that I want to point out. When you look up at the sky with just your eyes, or even a, a telescope, or maybe simple binoculars, and you see something that's red, it is actually red. And so we get pictures like this, where you can easily see the red versus the pink, or we get pictures of things that are highly red-shifted, or stuff like that. Hey, when we take pictures of this stuff, we can get a lot more detail than what our eyes can actually pick up. Okay, so for example, these nebulae are probably so faint, you're not going to be able to see them with your naked eye. Okay, stars that are moving away from us so fast that they've super red shifted, so they actually appear red, are going to be so faint, you're not going to be able to see them with your eye. So these things that we've talked about, like Doppler redshift and interstellar reddening, which is this reddening we've talked about with the uh, because of the interstellar medium, those effects are so subtle, we don't pick them up just with our eyes. We can only bring them out with photography. So what this means is if you look up and you see a star that appears red in color, it is actually red.